Hello, everyone, and welcome to Easy Allies Gamescom coverage and impressions. Uh, Sophia, Isla, and I are going to be just running down a bunch of games we saw. Yeah. And we're going to take turns just talking about them. And we're starting off... Some stuff's embargoed that we're really excited about, so look forward to that later. Uh, but this is a big grouping of everything we can talk about right now. Unless one of us passes out. Yes. Uh, right out of the gate. I mean, we're starting off hot here. Life is strange. Double exposure. 10 out of 10. Uh, so I got to play about a 30-minute chunk of uh, chapter one in Life is Strange. Double exposure. Uh, Max Caulfield has returned. And if you have seen the trailer a little while ago, you know that her friend gets murdered by mysterious circumstances and it's up to max to crack the crack the case if you will um she has not been using her powers very it's very like x-men vibes she has not been using her powers uh since the events of the original game uh for reasons uh traumatic reasons and but now uh, her powers have changed a little bit. Instead of rewinding time, she can shift realities to go to like an alternate universe. And in one of those universes, her friend is alive. So that's kind of the big hook and starting point of, uh, of the game. The portion I played is in the the new school where you're teaching, and uh, you and your friend, your friend Moses, he is delightful. I'm obsessed with this man. I want to hang out with him in every scene. Uh, he, uh, if you're super sensitive to spoilers as well, like dip dip out, skip this part. But this yeah. is I have to talk Time about it. Yeah, I have to talk about like a story beat because that's the whole game. Uh, but and it's the very beginning, so it's fine. But he. Took a uh, softy, soft, sh- softy. Let me see her name. Safi. Uh, he t- took Safi's camera from the crime scene, and they don't know that. Uh, but the police is like looking. The basically this cop, this detective, is like interrogating him. And as Max, you have to get into Moses's office to get the camera before the detective gets in there and finds it. So basically you are switching realities to get into the office and to like manipulate objects from, from one reality to the other. Uh, And it was just really interesting. It was very puzzly. It's like, you got to find this thing, you know, you got to find a, a, a key. Then you have to find where it is. You uh, Moses, it's, it sounds so confusing. Moses is like in the hallway being interrogated in one reality, but then in the other reality, he's inside just alone hanging out so you can like talk to him, ask questions about it. And then, yeah, you were just like bouncing back and forth realities. The Life is Strange vibes are there. You can like interact with everything. It looks beautiful. Um, and it's, yeah, the, the I don't want to give away what happens at the end, but basically, you know, you're looking for the camera in the room. Uh, and it was just really, really good. I immediately opened up Max's journal and was like reading all about, you know, the past events. So all of the Life is Strange vibes are there intact. And uh, I just felt really, really good and optimistic and happy about my time with it. It was excellent. Uh, Sophia and I saw a game that was a real surprise to us. <sighs> Try to under, try to explain this. Okay, so it is the night. It's 1985, but a slightly different kind of history of 1985. The internet's been around for a couple of years already. Uh, things are sort of like I don't want to say retro future, but it's sort of like you know, just a slightly different vibe to 1985. The tech's a little different, you know. Uh, the internet's been around for a minute, so it's you know things are like a little. Er- it's 1985, but things are a little earlier. That you know they you know whatever, and you're a hacker. Uh, I prefer to be called a hacker, and you are working with I guess the police or the CIA or whatever, and you are trying to crack down on these cartels. There's this guy who's hacking for the cartels, and through surveillance, you know that he leaves his office for like one hour every day. So you go into his office during that hour, hack into his computer, and 
like look through databases, try to find detail on like perps and like it's wild and it's got a lot of like it's it's a cool operating system. They call it like the Amiga whatever system. And you have to manage all the windows. There's the hacking database with the names uh, in it and images of people. Uh, there's like something like 500 people or something in this database. Pictures of all of them. And the characters, not all 500 of those, but like just the, char- the main characters in the thing, you know, they took the time and energy to like make sure they're casting people from those backgrounds and that you know and the the police chief or whatever i don't know if he's the police chief i don't remember but it, like i was thinking like man this guy looks like a young edward james Olmos. and then the guy was like yeah so we modeled this guy after a young J- edward james Olmos." and i was like okay yeah Excellent. um from that cop movie or show he did uh the name of which i don't remember but um yeah uh, a lot of managing windows uh bonkers the and, and it's it takes place in, it has very cool like VHS. There's a lot of like FMVs and stuff in the intro and there's like cool like synth pop kind of music. You have a little music player in the Windows thing. Yeah, like the aesthetic they said was like, it's it's 80s, but if the internet had existed for two years. Yeah. So the internet seems very 90s in that sense, but the whole theme is that. And they had like these cool synth wave songs. They had like a bunch that they got made for the game. Yeah um that were really cool like a little player in the corner and then the other corner they had the little um little guy it's like the little um what's it called? their version of clippy Clippy, uh yeah so it's Uh, their their little version of i can't remember what he was called but it was amigo i think because the it's the amigo system or whatever um which is very cool and also i mean a cool thing about it is some of the crimes and things that happen in the game happen in real life yeah. So they they reference things and then they said that there will be like links to the learn about the actual stuff that they are referencing. So you might uncover like a thing or like find some person and learn that they actually had something to do with something that's in real life. So it's really cool to like mix that with like fiction. And it's also like it's not just the 2D like computer. You also have 3D elements of like you're in this room. Maybe you have to like you know, your phone is ringing or like maybe you have to hide because something's happening and like maybe the internet went out and you have to go into like a room to turn it on. And so it's really cool. It's like yeah. very interesting. Going through drawers, looking at uh, phone records and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so when you're, when you're in the machine, you're going through and like you put in a fucking like a, a hard disk, you know, the little floppy disk. Yeah. yeah. And it loads a program onto it that lets you chat to your like police handler. And so you're like, Hey, I am instant messaging back and forth with this guy. And they're like, okay, they send you little missions and they're like, okay, you got to find out. We know this is the picture of the guy we're looking for, but we don't know any other information. So you have to go into the database, sort by picture, look through all the pictures and see if you can find that one guy. And sometimes it's like, okay, this one guy looks kind of like, you know, this guy or this guy. And so then you have to look at other details like on the face or whatever to make sure you're picking the right perp. Or maybe you have the name and a picture, but then there are three people named Kevin that looks sort of like that guy. And you're like, okay, well, this guy's got a mullet and this guy's got freckles. So it's probably this guy, you know. And then there's also like a little description on some of them and like location. Sometimes you just know like a license plate or whatever. Yeah. And then as you progress, it changes and the whole database change database changes too, which is insane. Like there's so much love and just, just dialogue and text in this game, but it's like just so detailed and awesome. So yeah, you'll have like a thing where like, okay, you need to find two people and one you have this one thing about them. The other one you might have just a picture of them or you get like another picture that's completely like just a different picture. And like who is that in the database? And so you have to look through it. It's just very, very cool. And like, yeah, there are puzzles and like using, you know, elimination of like, they couldn't, these three people have the same name, but this person did this and this person did that. Yeah. And then you can have like a quiz. So like every time you get a mission, it like changes a little bit the format, which is really cool. Yeah. Sometimes they're just filling, copy paste this information. Sometimes it's a quiz. So you have to, yeah, read the backgrounds or whatever. And they said that in later missions, uh, you'll also have, cause they keep adding apps. So you'll also have like a camera feed in the hallway and a person will be coming and you have to like look and see like, okay, is this person a friend or an enemy? 
should I stay here and talk to them or should I hide? It seems like it's going to get so gnarly yeah. and like written by one person. And like, they're so like the attention to detail is so precise that like, if the, if this episode takes place on August 12th, 1985, they even matched the weather that was happening in this area at that time. It's just like, okay. And yeah, like we were saying, like real historical stuff, like pipeline getting hacked and blowing up and like this cartel stuff was happening at this time. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's really cool. So if you like a lot of reading, a lot of Windows management, a desktop kind of management game, uh, and just like detail, true crime, details, story, and strategy puzzle stuff under pressure... Uh, this game seems awesome and the devs are super nice so and nice. we really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, that's vice undercover. Um, what do you got? All right. So my games con was a lot of indies mostly. Um, and I played a lot of them. I wanted to start with Tavern Keeper, which is the first game I ever played at my first games com. So it feels appropriate. Uh, it's this super awesome little like, management game kind of think like two point hospital but also like think like fantasy D D elements you have this cute little tavern that you're going to manage um and you have it's interesting because it's very different from a lot of those because it has story stuff too so you have this cute little tavern and you have all these different like patrons coming in like an orc or an elf and like all these different people and suddenly one one npc will come in and have a story and then you have to respond to that story so it's really cool that creates like more like life into just the management but it's also a lot of the like really fun cool aspects of of, of management games where like you know you decorate your tavern you build certain rooms and it has a, it has so much customizable stuff it was crazy they showed me how they have like that community contest of design of like furniture and stuff. So you can like customize your own furniture to put in the game. And like, I saw someone had made like a custom D and D table where they'd like taken rugs and like made them small to look like playing cards. <laughs> so they'd use like, you could like click it and see like 50 pieces had been used to make this one furniture piece, um, which is really cool. And they said they had like thousands of pieces that you can use in the game. Like it's insanely customizable. Um, and so you can really like, I, I, I could have sat there for hours and just like tinkered with all these little items and like, um, but yes, yeah, so you like, you hire people very similar to a lot of those games. Like you look at their stats and like, which one will fit in. It's not like, oh, I need this specific role. I'm going to hire this person. It's more like, I want to hire a person that can do multiple things. And so you assign them as like, um, the patrons come into the bar and, you know, um, but also like it felt very cozy like it didn't feel stressful like a lot of those games sometimes do where you're like oh my god I'm gonna lose everything it was more like we're taking it easy and then this cool little story comes up it has this really cool little like animation of this book like a fairy tale book opening and then you have like a picture of the patron and like has this cute little story um, which I really liked um, so yeah it's very like medieval style but then you have all these fantasy creatures um, which was cool. Uh, and yeah, you earn gold, you buy supplies, like you stock your bar and before you open. And so it's all that kind of vibe of like, what kind, what would I want to serve? And then you serve it to the patrons. And um, I saw this one little area that I could build in, which is like this cool little swamp area. So I had this, it, it was just like really nice. Like the atmosphere was cozy and like, yeah, D and D ish. Uh, and, um, I just found it really cute, really fun. Um, the stories are narrated, so that's really cool. So it's very, that was why I felt very d and too, not just the fantasy and medievalness of it all, but like, you know, in comes this like hero guy who's like obnoxious and you have to respond to him. So you could be like, no, I'm the hero. I'm the one who starts this story. And like their response will be different based on what you say, um, which was really, really nice. Um, but I mean, yeah, I think it'll be very intuitive for people that play those type of management. Like I knew all the controls without even trying, which is really nice to just like jump straight in. Like I, I know what this thing means and this thing means like that. I really, I really admire that. I like that in those games where it's like, you don't have to change a lot of stuff here. It works. It's great. Um, and it's been worked on for years and years. Uh, and it's just super cozy. Um, and 
I don't know. The devs were wonderful and lovely. Everyone that I met in that booth were great. Uh, and I am very, very excited um, to see it release hopefully soon, but no early access soon, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I had a blast. It's right up my alley. So I'm very excited for everyone to get to play it. Yeah. Next up from the developers of Little Nightmare 1 and 2, Reanimal. This game is out of control. Immediate 10 out of 10. Blown away. Blown away. Not much to say about it because we legit watched like a brief overview and then we played. There was a couple of us in the room and we like handed it off. So like together we played maybe like 10 or 15 minutes and I played like, you know, seven. Uh, but it's got Little Nightmares vibes and inside vibes if you like those games. And you are these two characters and you're trying to escape this really horrifying place. It's the one with the animals. So there's like this giant pig that goes by. Uh, just the, the lighting and the atmosphere of this game were top notch 10 out of 10. Uh, no real HUD, you know, it's just like a little bit of icons you see if you can like interact with something, but basically you are like protecting your, your partner person and you're just being like chased this the entire time. There's like this giant, out, yeah, there's this giant like furry spider monster that like throws up like mannequins or something. It was like throwing things up, uh, and just all these weird creatures and it's platformer uh and i really liked what the game was doing one with lighting but then two with the the uh cinematography like there's this part where you're running up the stairs you know and the camera like kind of goes in overhead and it's going up and the spider is like running up at you or you'll run at the camera just some really really cool stuff uh, a little bit of platforming like i said like jumping and shimmying and hiding you know stealth parts uh and then we had to like escape this attic we had to find a key uh just really really good atmosphere and vibes i was immediately invested in the characters uh and i cannot wait for this game i cannot wait uh next up i i had a hands off uh of the occultist which is a kind of like uh, i don't know it's not like um i mean it's a horror game but it's sort of like not a jump scares horror game it's more atmospheric it's got creepy vibes and body horror vibes and uh, that kind of stuff. Um, 10 to 12 hour game made in UE5. Uh, you can, um, you're can you carrying this like, it looks like a bird skull kind of. It's like this weird relic. It's got like, you know, runes and stuff on it. And they called it the pendulum. And it has a few abilities. You can kind of look through it like a monocle. And uh, that lets you see the past. And it also lets you see specters and clues. Uh, you can use it to manipulate time. So you can like roll back time on something. So like a duct had fallen or whatever. And they like put it back up so they could get through. Um, it, uh, But it damages your health to use it. And your like hands go black. Uh, it's an interactive investigation game. That's right. I remember they called it something like different. You know, uh, you hide, you use cunning, and you figure out the mysteries and stuff. There's not like a lot of... It's not really about combat necessarily. Um, it looks really cool visually, like a really neat thing. Has seven kind of main areas, some of which are the orphanage, circus, hospital, and cemetery. Uh, there are spirits and stuff and like kind of ghouls and things. And then in the circus area, there's like possessed toys and mannequins and stuff like that, uh, which looked really freaky and weird. They were like in cages and stuff. And the, the main guy was like a, I can't remember if he said it was like a toy maker or something. Um, you have a bird power and which is kind of cool because the pendulum looks like a bird skull. So I feel like it maybe like turns into this bird and you could fly with the bird and use it to get different views of the area. And you also can like pop balloons and stuff that you have to do for certain uh, puzzles. Uh, that was interesting. Um, yeah, real creepy vibes. It was really good. Uh, it's Geralt's voice actor is in there. Um, I, I didn't catch if it was the main character or if one of the v villains, but He's in there. Uh, cool puzzles, one of which was a cute story that they told. Uh, the devs, I, I guess, are from Spain. Um, and in the city that they lived in, uh, there are these lion statues outside of the university that are um, kind of like 
the, the, the kind of lore is that they're cursed, right? And if you count the lions as you go in, you'll fail your degree. <laughs> um, and so the puzzle in the game is you use the pendulum to see like where there need to be lions and how they need to be faced. And you have to count them as part of the puzzle. So like they, I think it was kind of a cheeky little nod to their history. And even the like PR person was like, Oh, I never knew that. Um, so that was kind of cool. Yeah. The occultist, you know, I got a really brief look hands off. So it looked cool. Uh, can't say much more than that. Sort of like reanimal. I'm just like, Hey, yeah, it looks sick. Um, yeah. All right. Got another indie here. Uh, I played Stormforge. It is very, very fun. And I think uh, we should definitely all play it together when it comes out. Um, it's essentially a Valheim meets Zelda. You do all the classic, you know, foraging. You build a camp um, and you hunt. But also you chase storms, which is like the whole thing. You have these different storms that have different abilities. You as a Stormforger... Uh, can like take abilities from different storms and like infuse your weapon with it, which is really, really cool. Um, so I, I got to play a little bit. Most of it was hands off, but um, yeah, essentially each storm has different layers. And so you get certain things from each layer and like the art style is beautiful. It's really cool, really vibrant. Um, and something that's really interesting is you can use modded items in the game and like as you add them they'll change into the art style that the game has which is very like drawn and like just really pretty um, and uh, you know yeah foraging fighting boss battles kind of the the classic uh, of those games but yeah it also felt just very easy to play um, challenging but easy to like like just very natural in the controls uh, and you can customize characters and, you know, the difficulty will change with multiplayer. But they also said that it would be a great game to play alone as well. So it doesn't have to be like a lot of those games. I feel is like multiplayer kind of must. This one yeah. is like, I can actually jump into this by myself and it would still feel manageable. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just looked really fun. Um, I really like the art style. Uh, I love the what you get in return for beating a storm is really cool. Like there's some risk. Like if you in, if I, you were in it for long enough, like you start taking damage and stuff like that. So you've got a boss and you're taking damage. It's a lot of stuff going on at the same time. Uh, so it's super challenging. And like the, the style was kind of cool. Cause it was like, kind of like, like, like Roman type, but also like Viking, like it was very, it was really cool, unique kind of thing. And they, yeah, they showed me some of the buildings that you can build and stuff, and it's just really, really pretty. Uh, and I'm excited because I like Valheim, and you know, it's gonna this this is uh, this is gonna join in the line of like cool, cozy games where you hunt, you build, you forage, and then and also yeah, vibe out and like yeah, like they were saying like when you play multiplayer, like somebody wants to stay back and build, and someone wants to go hunting, yeah. and like it's cool that you get to do all those things. Um, and yeah, shout out to the devs. They're very, 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 very kind people and really wonderful. So I'm excited. Cool. Yeah. Next up, Stalker 2. Stalker, out of control game. Uh, I played the original on PC when it came out and it was like too complicated for me. I was too young. So the first thing I noticed was like, oh, this game is actually like, way less complicated than I was anticipating. Uh, really clean UI, you know, you have your your backpack grid based, nice. you know, you loot a body or whatever and it's like, you can like drag things over to your inventory or take it all. So it's that style. Um, the biggest surprise about Stalker 2, I put it on PC. The biggest surprise about it was how well it ran. Oh. It was polished as hell not one stutter not one glitch nothing it just ran perfectly uh so yeah i was, I was just surprised by that um because i remember i had just like issues with the the original also yeah. and just like you know it was, back in the day. it was back in the day so yeah um stalker 2 though you it starts out i played the very beginning of the game and i <laughs> i uh was tasked with taking this device into the the you know wasteland nuclear zone or whatever it is and i had to like <clears throat> take this device to different locations 
to uh, to do some research, you know, find some. There's like this big mystery, you know. I don't have all the story details there, yeah. um, but the environment the environments are pretty wide open. It's not like fully open world, I don't think, but it's like pretty big open spaces and had my pistol had my knife uh the pace is really deliberate the atmosphere is really exceptional uh this is like survival horror vibes all the way uh i was like sneaking through ruined buildings you know looting abandoned homes for supplies bandages and stuff and never got lost there's like waypoints or whatever and It'll like guide you to the area and then you kind of have to like look around, you know, when you get to the area to figure out what you're doing. But there was combat against some like monster freaks. There was like this invisible creature that would just like appear in front of me and slash me, scared the hell out of me. I start blasting this thing with a machine gun. It runs off, turns invisible, predator style, keeps coming back and attacking me. The thing was ferocious ammo was limited for the for the machine gun i had so it was really really intense uh and i loved it and that was just like one monster one little encounter like this game is gonna be so harrowing so intense uh and then of course like you know walking dead style the humans are the real threat some humans show up they're out of control uh so it was funny one of the devs too said because i like got shot at one point and then I just booked it. I just ran. I was like, I'm, I'm out of here. Uh, and at the end, he laughed. He was like, yeah, you like missed kind of a little Aryan encounter there because you just like ran off. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, they, they freaked me out. You know, I got, I got shot at or whatever. And he's like, he's like, yeah, you know, that's, that's what we love about the game is like there's different ways to kind of, you know, get past certain situations. And I really liked that. So, yeah, Stalker 2 is shaping up. I was hyped before. Now I'm like, yo, this is this is top tier. The little bit I played, you know, it was only like 20 minutes, 30 minutes intro of the game. Who knows what what else is to come? But from what I played, it was really, really good. So, yeah, Stalker Two, big, big, big thumbs up. Awesome. I played Civ Seven, and it was. Awesome. Um, all right. February 11th, all consoles and PC, or, the, you know, the ones that they're coming out on, same day. That's pretty wild. First time they've ever done that. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep this as brief as I possibly can. It's, it's a lot to go over. Because you can look at Civ 7 and you'd be like, it just looks like, it looks like Civ. What's, what's new, right? And they, they had said in the... So they gave us a little presentation for 20 minutes and then I played it for 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, it, it went by real fast. I was like, when they said, okay, your time is up, I was like, no! I was just starting to make moves, dude. Um, okay, so in the intro thing, they went into how history is built in layers, right? Um, they talked about how they want it to be accessible and base level. You could just like pick it up, start playing. You know, the first time you play it through, it's just pretty standard stuff but then you start developing into the the big systems the hardcore systems you know uh, but they were talking about historical immersion with real roots in history and how there are more narrative choices now like stuff will pop up and it'll be like um you know hey our people are eating a lot of dates and some people are saying that our production is down and and like because everyone's just partying and eating bad dates there it is eating these dates all the time and then you can respond with like okay, hey, let's eat less dates, or you can spit out a, a date yourself and just smile, you know, uh, stuff like that. It, it was really cute, like adds little kind of stuff. But uh, they said that the previous sequels, like kind of from four or five and six were more iterative. They kind of just like refined and, and built on what was already there. Seven is kind of a new beast. It's... Uh, it's still Civ. It still feels like Civs. If it still feels great, I love Civ and I loved this. Um, it has instead of eras, it has ages, and they talked about history being in layers. Like I said, so uh, you know, if you start with Rome, that's the first layer, 
and then society moves on. Civilizations kind of change over time, right? So there are three layers, three ages, antiquity, exploration, and modern. And each age has different systems. Uh, think a lot of things change per age. Um, you have a thing called legacy paths, which are sort of the the uh, old wind conditions at the end, which is like cultural victory, economic victory, military victory, or religious victory. Um, these have sort of like paths that happen through the ages, through each age, and you could pick what you want and have your advisor kind of like try to lead you toward that. And I, I tend to, to go with culture. And so that one's about building wonders and doing this and that. And if you specialize in that legacy, you get certain bonuses that'll help you later on. But you could do, you know, in antiquity, you could do culture and in exploration, you could do military and, and, and then you'd get different weird things. Where it gets crazy is their age transitions and when you transition from an age to the next age you pick a new sieve you basically pick a new civilization also when you start the game you pick a leader and a civilization and they don't have to match they can match and that obviously it has like historical uh accuracy if you care about that but also it has certain bonuses because they they synchronize or whatever synergize well but uh, the game gives you, so like I pay, played a uh, Heth, Heth Patet or whatever from Egypt, uh, probably saying that wrong, but, uh, and I'm losing my voice, so whatever, but, uh, she, you know, comes from Egypt. So you could pick the canon choice of Egypt or it gave you like, Hey, this is historically rel relative, uh, culture that you could also start with. I don't remember which one, but like, because geographically they were like next door, right? And that makes sense too. And the, the, the bonuses and the changes are different based on that choice, right? Or you could just pick any sieve you want with any leader and like have fun, go for it. Then where it gets crazy is as you play, when you do the age transition, you could say, okay, do you want to stick with this? Or here's the next like historically relevant thing that like the next layer that like historically kind of, you know, whether literally or not, would sort of morph, this society could kind of morph into, right? So you could add that on top. Or, because based on how you're playing, the example they gave is, you improved three horse uh, tiles, maybe you want to evolve with uh, adding Mongolia on top of Egypt, you know? And that is so interesting to me because it's like catering to a lot of different play styles and like, responding to how you're playing in such a cool way um it's it's just really really neat and like obviously experiencing it makes it more understandable than i'm probably doing but uh yeah and toward the end of each age they have a crisis system where negative policies start coming in and then something will happen to shake up the age whether it be civil unrest or a war or a natural disaster um and it kind of is simulating how in real life societies you know Rome wasn't built in a day and it didn't fall in a day, uh, but there were reasons. And, you know, so whether it's cultural or environmental impact or, or uh, pressures, you know, it forces a change. And that kind of like forces your change into this evolution, into this other thing. And also something that's cool is they said they didn't really expand into this too much, but they said darker paths can open if you don't do very well. You can lash out at the world. Losing can be fun, too. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, do you just like nuke the world if you lose? I was going to say, do you just Gandhi? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, the leaders aren't just historical um, kings, queens, presidents, whatever. Uh, they're going to have uh, leaders from art, science, and philosophy. The leader persists through the whole game. So if you pick, you know, uh, Julius Caesar, you're, you're Julius Caesar the whole game and you just become, you know, I don't know. You go from Rome to being China or whatever, and you know whatever you end up doing, that that's how it is. Um, yeah, uh, Gwendolyn Christie is the narrator, of which Captain is really cool. Phasma fame of Captain Phasma fame, nice. and nothing else. Uh, um, uh, really cool. The scout boats and the warriors, at least for Egypt, but I assume for everybody, uh, if they hit water, they just turn into a little boat and go for it. But maybe that's because I researched sailing. Actually, now that I think about it. Uh, no more barbarians. There are independent powers instead. There's influence. Towns turn into cities. So your second thing that you make is like a town. It has to evolve into a city. Um, 
You get uh, commanders, which can join six units into an army. The commander gets the uh, XP instead of the, ar the armies. Uh, empire resources or city resources. So you can get stuff that is for your whole thing or just for one little city. Uh, you can set up trade routes by walk. You have to walk the trader there first. So you can't just be like, I'm going to trade with these guys and it happens. You have to like actually get there, which is kind of cool. Um, I loved it. Like it, the whole, the whole takeaway is, um, it, it felt streamlined. It felt quick, but it also felt impactful and more like, in historically accurate i guess or like that i hate that phrase but like it felt like things made sense and like logically led into it the, the other things um and it's beautiful it ran well it looked great uh music you know i'm very excited Civ 7 dude for real february 11th i want to talk about a surprise for me uh that i didn't see coming it's a game called constance uh wonderful little indie game that was just so i don't know i i didn't i didn't think i would love it as much as i did i didn't really like just learning about it shout out to the dev such a cool dude so passionate this is like a small team's first game i think this is their first game uh it's essentially like a 2d hand-drawn action adventure platformer um and a lot of the themes are around mental health and you play as this little painter girl with this pink hair and she has a pink paintbrush. Uh, and your paintbrush you can use in certain like, so it's platforming and then you have little puzzles. So you have to use different uh, tools to like help you away. Like there's like a thing that can shock you and you got to use your brush and then jump through it, you know, like, like spin through it in order to be able to go through it. Um, and it got really challenging at one point. Um, it was, it ran really well. And I'm not like, I, I love, you know, games like Rayman. This game of the same Rayman feeling of, like, it felt so smooth jumping and, like, dashing. Um, and it just, yeah, it felt so good the moment you made something. After you get stuck, it didn't take me, like, 15 turns, you know? It was just, like, a couple of turns, and then I got it. And it just felt so nice, so smooth. Um, and, yeah, the themes are really lovely. Um, and the art's really gorgeous. And I'm just really excited to, to see um, the whole game. Uh, it's probably going to come up next year, I think. Um, but yeah, it was just, I, I really, I, I'm not like, I love, I love um, those types of games and platformers. But sometimes, you know, when you get stuck, you get frustrated and you're just kind of like, okay. Uh, this one just felt very like the right amount of punishing in the sense that you don't like have to go 10,000 miles back and do a whole bunch of stuff again. Um, it started you in a nice distance and then, yeah, it was just really fun. And, uh, I don't know when I, you know, when you play a game and you realize like, oh, there's some heart in this, like there's some, like the person who made this, the people that made this put a lot of themselves in it. That's what I felt. And like, um, talking about it, uh, and just, yeah, it was just a wonderful little game and I'm very, very excited to see how it turns out and play the rest of it. I, I wish I could have played more, but yeah, it was wonderful. If you like what you hear or see, follow us on patreon.com slash easy allies and uh, youtube.com slash easy allies. All the socials and the slash easy allies. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Love and respect. Also, there are more. Uh, we have more impressions, more reactions to yeah. other other things we played. So yeah. check those out or yeah. Check out, check out our big uh, roundup of impressions from Gamescom. And we had an interview with Casper Van Dien, Rico himself. Uh, that'll be coming up soon if it's not already up. So check those out. Look forward to those. Uh, thanks a lot. Bye.